You were covering the 2008-2009 great, uh, great financial crisis. Uh, do you have PTSD? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly have a sense of deja vu. I mean, as you, you're right. I lived in Washington throughout that crisis, and I'm here. I was here in the U.S. Uh, this last weekend when the whole news broke about Silicon Valley Bank and. Uh, there was definitely a sense of deja vu. It's not on the scale yet, but but it's also, I think, more systemic than people thought even a week ago. So I think we are seeing a, a realization that the banks are more fragile than people thought they were because after the 2008 financial crisis, and we can, we can talk about this, but there was a huge amount of, um, you know, regulation and recapitalization and focus on strengthening the banks. But two things kind of we've now realized happened since then. One is that some of that regulatory framework was rolled back in 2017 and 18. And so Silicon Valley Bank would have been required to have much more rigorous supervision and to have had a kind of what's called a, a, you know, a plan for its own demise, which, ha which the systemically important big banks have to have. And the original rules were that any bank bigger than with assets more than 50 billion would have to do that. That was raised to 250 billion, and so Silicon Valley Bank and others didn't were no longer subject to that rigor. Had they been subject to it, this might not have happened. Secondly, and more importantly, the, the whole reorganization after 2000 and 2009 was designed to focus on problems of credit, because that was the cause of the financial crisis. Inflation was low. In fact, people worried about deflation. No one worried about duration risk. No one worried about what happened to the value of, you know, treasuries on banks' balance sheets when interest rates rose very sharply. That wasn't sort of part of the thinking in 2009, 2010, when these regulatory reforms were done. Mm -hmm. And now we're in an environment where we've had, obviously, the fastest interest rate, interest rate rise in decades, and we're seeing the consequences that actually these large holdings of government bonds, which were deemed to be part of making banks safer, are less safe than you thought because the banks have, effectively, if you mark them to market, they have big losses on them. At the same time, we did have the Sunday uh, announcement uh, that basically said everything's going to be fine. We'll back up all the deposits no matter what. I mean, I'm a, when I was a young boy, long before your time, Groucho Marx had a program on te television in the United States where you had, say the magic word. You said the magic word, systemic. Systemic seems to be a get-out-of-jail-free card now. Everything seems to be systemic. The government steps in, makes it all better. We did have that, and, and that's the... And I think when we look back at this episode, that is going to be the extraordinary development that on Sunday, not only were all depositors in those two banks bailed out, and of course, you know, there was an FDIC limit of 250,000. That's, you know, exemption made, all depositors bailed out. But in addition, the Fed instituted for one year, supposedly, a facility that banks could get liquidity at the par value of any treasuries and any government bonds that they hold. And the idea of a lender of last resort is to lend freely, quickly, against good collateral and at a punitive rate. But what we've seen really in the last few years, few decades actually, has been an expansion of the Federal Reserve's kind of definition of what being a lender of last resort is, lending against much more collateral, lending more freely, becoming, in, you know, after 2008, 2009, people talked to the Fed as a market maker of last resort, much broader. And what happened last Sunday was a very big shift because, in effect, it wasn't imposing any haircut on the bank's ability to borrow. They can borrow at par, which meant, in effect, they're getting subsidized by the Federal Reserve for their liquidity. And I, it's supposed to be a one-year facility. I don't know. Those kind of one-year facilities have a habit of changing. And that's a big shift in what the Fed does. So I don't want to go too far with this, but The Economist does take us sort of to larger thoughts here. Are we somewhat redefining capitalism? Everybody <laughs> wins. Nobody loses. It's sort of like you know, your children, that everybody gets a trophy. Nobody you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Are we creating a beta society where there's no alpha? I think the short answer to that is yes. And I think this is, we will, this is a big, a big step that the Fed has taken, and it's couched in the language of it's only for one year and so forth, but I think it really is a big step, and it's a big step that perhaps we might come to regret. And it's, it's not just central banks, and now I'm going to go really big picture, but I think there is a sense in which governments have, over the past few years, bailed out, supported in all manner of areas. People, we are, we are no longer so comfortable with failure and with shock. What worries me now and what worries me really about what the Fed has done is that we're doing this in an environment where inflation is uncomfortably high. And the really worrying trade-off will be when the Fed's goals of financial stability, 
clash with the goals of getting inflation down. And the more support you give and the more you bail out, the more you try and focus on short-term financial stability, you may be making it harder to reach your inflation target. And that, I think, gets you into a very, very uncomfortable world. Is there a risk of, by eliminating the downside, you also limit the upside? That is to say, everyone's protected, and as a result, we are not as innovative. We don't have the creative destru destruction that Schumpeter talked about. That, in fact, we don't have the growth in productivity and otherwise that we might otherwise have. Well, I think you're right in the sense that by limiting the downside, you keep zombie companies, zombie banks uh, that should be dissolved alive for longer than they otherwise would be. And that's absolutely the downside of any broad bailout, that you, you don't have the Schumpeterian creative destruction. And you also have, I think, a, a society that rightly people are kind of get profoundly disillusioned with because, you know, the wealthy are sort of heads I win, tails you lose. Mm. You know, if you get, it is, and I've heard it a lot this week, it, you know, it is, it is striking that, you know, these venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, people who have been you know, making a fortune are so, and, and, and essentially, you know, mostly are sort of libertarians who want the government off their back. The minute something like this happens, they're all screaming for assistance. Uh, and it's a little bit uh, uncomfortable. So I can see why the politics of this is really quite tricky.